So that's some very important concepts we need to worry about and consider and that will continue throughout all of a statics course. I think it's time for some examples. We've got at least a couple here we can work through. Let's look at the first one here. So pretty standard pin and roller setup. So I'll draw a pin on one end. We'll just go ahead and lock it to the ground of some kind. So pin will attach a beam behind that. And then on the other end of this beam, we'll say <laughs> it's a crazy 20 meter long beam. Uh, I say crazy, I don't know. It could be a model of a simple bridge. And then on the other end, we've got this roller. One might say, well, why would you have a roller on this thing? Well, the roller would allow it to expand, basically. As this thing gets, if this is an actual bridge, for example, um, it won't look like this necessarily, but if you had something like a bridge and it got good and hot, then it, all of this metal in here would need to, even metal or concrete, whatever it is, would need to be able to expand. And so it, as it expands, if I've got a pin on both ends, it's just gonna buckle and it's gonna try to break in the middle. But if I've got some some structure on the other end that allows it to move back and forth or up and down somehow, um, then that allows it, as it expands, to basically kind of um, relieve some, some tension or some stress, if you will. Now, this is actually on an incline surface. So this isn't, I don't know how practical this would be, but it's, it's a problem, it's fine. This is on an incline surface. This incline surface is described with a similar triangle, so it's probably a little steeper than I've drawn it because this is a 5, 12, and the hypotenuse would be 13 triangle used to describe the geometry of this surface. So it's just a roller on a normal surface over here. Uh, there is a single force right in the middle. You might could just call it the weight. But there's a, a single 500 Newton force applied to this thing. And again, it's a 20 meter beam right in the middle, 10 meters out from the left and 10 meters from the right is where that force is being applied. And so we'll just call it A for the pin, B for the roller. And the problem very simply is just going to ask us, as a lot of these problems will, find the reactions at A and B. Now, as we've discussed earlier, there will be a table in your book, in the Hibbler text, it's table 5.1. <clears throat> and that table will illustrate uh, common reactions. It'll show you when, when you draw a free body diagram of this thing, what you should replace these reactions with, what's the equivalent value, equivalent of type of uh, forces and or moments. That's okay. You're welcome to just refer back to that table. Um, you're also welcome to look at this. And remember, I showed you, I had some 3D printed examples of some hinges. Now I'm home today and I don't, have those. Um, I guess I do have my handy stapler here and that is a hinge right there, right? So basically this would be like point A that you see in this diagram here and this would be like our beam and so notice that this can rotate. Because it can rotate that means there's no reaction moment there at point A but because I can't pull it in the X direction or in the Y direction all I can get it to do is rotate at that point. That's essentially what I've got there. So I can't move it in the X or Y direction. That means there's a force in the X and a force in the Y direction. But uh, it, again, because it can, it can, because it can rotate, means there's not a couple reaction at that location. All that to say, what are we trying to do? We're trying to find these reactions. The reactions are going to be forces and/or moments. Uh, in this case, they're just going to be forces. It's going to be A, X, A, Y here. And I'm going to have a normal force on any kind of roller. It's always going to be a normal force. So I'm going to have unknown forces. So what's a good tool for finding unknown forces? Free body diagram. It's a good place to start. So if we draw a free body diagram of this beam, I'm going to replace these connections with the appropriate equivalent forces. Uh, the reactions is what we call these. Again, because it's a pin at point A, there's going to be an unknown A, X and an unknown A, Y. Uh, I have my applied 500 newtons right there in the middle of this 20 meter beam, 10 meters and 10 meters. 
Now I've got a normal force at point B because this again is a roller on this inclined surface. So uh, it can move parallel to the surface, but it can't move into the surface. So that means I have a force being applied that's basically resisting this thing moving into the surface. So it's gonna be normal to that surface. You could draw a single force here and draw it normal to this 5, 12, 13 surface. I'm gonna go ahead and draw it in components. I like to resolve on my free body diagram. So I'm gonna have some fraction times B and some fraction times B in both the X and the Y direction. So there's gonna be a number beside these Bs. Let's figure out what that is. So this is what I what I will tell you. A simple, this is how I remember it. Because the surface is five in the horizontal and 12 in the vertical, this the normal force B is gonna be perpendicular to that. Right? And I'll draw it down here in just a second. In fact, let's just do that. Let's just kind of to the side. You don't have to draw this. If you understand how this works, you don't necessarily have to draw this, but if I've got this surface that is on this five, 12, meaning that I've got some unknown angle theta there, means that I've got down here some unknown angle, same unknown angle theta there. Now, this normal force, B, is going to be perpendicular to that. So that means this angle is going to be 90 minus theta. So if this is 90 minus theta, because this is theta and this is 90, this must be 90 minus theta. If this is 90 minus theta, and then this, so it's 90 minus theta from horizontal, meaning it's theta from vertical. So the normal force B is gonna be an angle theta from vertical because the surface is some angle theta from horizontal. So if this is 512, meaning 12 over 13 is the sine of theta for this surface, right? Well, so the 12 is the opposite of theta here. So that means if I drew a triangle on this thing, on the force that's normal to it, if, theta, if the 12, which is opposite of theta, is vertical here, that means the 12, which is gonna be opposite of theta, is gonna be the horizontal to the normal. And the five is gonna be adjacent to theta, as it is here. So that means if, it's hors if the five is horizontal here, when I go normal to, the five is gonna be vertical. So B actually looks like this, right? So I kind of, if I draw it without all the extra triangles there, B looks like this, where I've got, again, this surface is five in the horizontal, that means the five is gonna be vertical. The surface is 12 in the vertical, that means normal to it. The B reaction, which is normal to this surface, is gonna have five in the vertical, 12 in the horizontal, since the surface has five horizontal, 12 vertical. It flips. Hopefully that helps. I've tried to, to show you a, a few different ways to maybe look at this. Um, but again, the vertical component here, because the, the five is horizontal on the surface, when it's normal to it, the five is gonna be the vertical component. So 5 thirteenths B is gonna be the vertical component because the 12 is vertical to the surface. Normal to that, the 12 is gonna be horizontal uh, on the, the vertical reaction. So 12 thir 12 13 B, in the x direction, in this case negative x, because again, this is normal too, so it's pushing up and it's pushing to the left. So 12 thirteenths pushing to the left, negative x, 5 thirteenths pushing up uh, in the positive y. And so that's our free body diagram, and that will make writing equilibrium equations then pretty simple if we get that drawn right. So again, sum of forces in the x direction um, it's one two-dimensional free body diagram. I can write up to three equations. So sum of forces in the x direction, I can say that is positive ax minus 12 thirteenths b. <clears throat> and then I can do sum of, uh, well, 
I can do sum of forces in the y. That's equal to 0. So that's equal to ay minus 500 newtons plus 5 thirteenths b. Now you can write these in any order, but I just I tend to start with a positive term, and that way I don't have to write a negative sign in front of it. I'm just a little bit lazy in that aspect. But you could start with a negative term, no reason. Um, just keep the signs straight. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know why my voice decided to crack there. Uh, sum of moments about the a to about point a. Sum of moments about point a. Uh, we're going to set that equal to zero. So both ax and ay pass through point a. Right, point A is kind of right here in the middle of the beam uh, at this end. Notice this X component of B, its line of action also passes through point A. So the X component of B does not cause a moment. I've only got two things causing a moment here at this end. Right? Um, so if I take some moments, uh, I've got this 500 Newtons. It's actually acting in a clockwise direction. So it's minus 500 Newtons times 10 meters. I know I broke my normal rule where I normally start with a positive term. I could have started with this 5 thirteenths. That's a positive term. But again, notice it's not because it's down. It's because if I remember, if I put my pin on this and I push in the direction of that force, I get the paper to rotate in a clockwise fashion. That's the reason it's negative. It has nothing to do with up or down, left or right. It's clockwise or counterclockwise, clockwise being negative. Add to then this one, this 5 thirteenths. Direction tells me, again, if I push my paper in the direction of that guy, notice I'm getting a counterclockwise rotation. That's positive. So positive 5 thirteenths B, and that is out at a distance of 20 meters from point A. And again, these other three, this X component, AX, AY, all pass through point A. So no moment caused by any of those. So I've got three equations here. I've got AX, AY, and B are my three unknowns. Three equations, three unknowns, solvable. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead and pause here. Run your numbers. Do your algebra. Run your numbers um, and get us an answer. All right, you got it. I have written here. Tell me if you get something different. But I have written down here that AY is... 250 newtons. I've got B is equal to 650 newtons. And I've got AX comes out to be an even 600 newtons. Again, why do I have you, why do I say pause and run these numbers, do the algebra? Um, because if you're, if you're just sitting there watching me, most people don't retain much. Most people need to be active and engaged and actually doing something. So if I say, well, do the algebra and do the calculations, that needs to be kind of auto almost automatic. So how do you do that? Well, you practice it. So I'm giving you an opportunity to really practice it, but it also gives you an opportunity to, to stay engaged with me and not just be passively watching videos and hopefully staying away. <laughs> now, I do want to mention here... Um, We've talked previously about you don't have to write two force equations in a moment every single time. Um, notice instead of some forces in the y direction, you can't see that, I apologize. Instead of writing this sum of forces in the y direction, I could have written um, sum of moments about point B. And if I write the sum of moments about point B and set that equal to zero, and scroll this back here so you can see the free body diagram, so it makes it easy to write this. Sum of moments about point B. Notice these two now, these both pass through point B, so no uh, moment caused by these two. AX uh, passes through point B also, so no moment caused by AX. I've only got AY and this 500 Newtons. So um, if I do that, notice that this 500 Newtons if I push in the direction of that 500 Newtons, that is a counterclockwise spin. So that is a positive term. So that is 500 Newtons. That's a counterclockwise spin at 10 meters. And then I've also got a Y out here pushing in a clockwise direction. So that's actually negative. Again, it doesn't matter whether it's up, down, left, or right. The only thing that matters is a counterclockwise or clockwise. And I don't know, maybe you guys are getting tired of hearing me say that. It's important, it bears repeating. 
here's another equation, right? Now I say instead of sum of forces in the F, Y, um, Y, well, if you look, notice this is an equation, but it's got two unknowns in it. I can't solve this one, but I can solve this one, right? So if I've got this equation, if I've got the X equation, I've got sum of moments about A. Well, the sum of moments of A only has one unknown. I can solve that directly. Sum of moments about B only has one unknown. I can solve it directly. And then once I've got B, I can plug in here and get AX. There's nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with these three equations. I'm just suggesting to you there's also absolutely nothing wrong with one, two, three equations. Uh, and you can solve all three of those accordingly. Sometimes I will write more than one moment equation, especially if I've got more than one unknown, like because I've got more than one unknown at this point right here, and also I've got another unknown passes through that point. So this is a very good candidate for writing a moment equation because there's only one unknown causing a moment. And then my, my point down here is, well, notice there's only one unknown in this equation. Right? If I take a moment about point B, there's only one unknown that doesn't pass through point B. That's AY. Anyway, uh, that's a little longer than 15 minutes. That's a good stopping place. Uh, let me know if you have questions. See you on the next one.